I again uh, recognise and call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker. I inform the House that the Treasurer is in the budget lock-up and will be absent from question time today. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister will answer questions on his behalf. It now being question time, are there any questions? I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister promised the Australian people on the night before the last election no cuts to education, no cuts to health, no changes to the pension, no changes to the GST and no cuts to the ABC or the SBS. Will the Prime Minister repeat that promise now? And if not, how can the Australian people trust anything this Prime Minister has to say? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, as uh, everyone in this chamber, as everyone viewing uh, here and around the country knows that tonight we have a budget. Tonight we have a budget. It is a very, very important budget, uh, which uh, obviously represents the values of this government uh, and the necessity of this government's repairing of the debt and deficit disaster that we were left by members opposite, by the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Shorten, and his colleagues. Now, Madam Speaker, I want to assure members opposite, I want to assure the Labor Party, I want to assure all the people of Australia, we will fix the debt and deficit disaster that we were left by the Labor Party. And, Madam Speaker, we will do it, we will do it in ways which are faithful to the commitments that we made pre-election. We will do it in ways which are faithful to the commitments that we made pre-election. And let me remind members opposite, every day during the election campaign, I expressed the objectives of this coalition. Should we be a government, we would stop the boats, we would scrap the carbon tax, we would build the roads of the 21st century, and above all else, above all else, above all else, we would bring the budget back under control. That's what this nation needs, and that's what we will deliver. I call the honourable member for Solomon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is the government keeping its commitment to get the budget back under control? I call the honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I do thank the member for Solomon for her question. Uh, and I can assure her and I can assure all members of this parliament that this is a government that will keep its commitments. And the commitments that we endlessly repeated before the election were to stop the boats, to scrap the carbon tax, uh, to build the roads of the 21st century and to bring the budget back under control. These are the commitments that we made and these are the commitments that we will honour. And, Madam Speaker, isn't it so necessary? For isn't it so necessary that we get the budget back under control? Because, Madam Speaker, what the Labor Party and what members opposite did was left us a legacy of debt and deficit stretching as far as the eye can see. It was intergenerational theft, Madam Speaker. That's what they left us. $123 billion in cumulative budget surpluses, 660 uh, budget deficit, $667 billion in projected debt. This is the debt and deficit disaster that members opposite left us. And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, members opposite knew they had a problem. Members opposite knew they had a problem. That's why they went to the election, promising $5 billion of spending cuts. $5 billion of spending cuts that they've walked away from. That they've walked away from. They have walked away from their own scant commitments to budget responsibility. Well, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the people of Australia did not elect us to make easy decisions. They elected us to make the tough decisions. They didn't elect us to be cheapskate populists. They elected us to do what is necessary for our country, and we will, and we will. The, uh, the management of opposition business. So, Madam Speaker, there, there is far too much cheering from those behind the Prime Minister, and it's difficult to hear. 
The manager of opposition business knows that that is not a point of order. The Prime Minister has the call and we won't have a repeat performance. Madam Speaker, the people of Australia understand that this country's fiscal position is simply unsustainable. Every month this country is borrowing one billion dollars. That's one thousand millions of dollars every single month. We're borrowing that just to pay the interest on our debt. We're borrowing to pay the interest on our borrowing, and as every single Australian out there in the real world knows, it is simply unsustainable. It is simply unsustainable. So, Madam Speaker, we will tackle the problem. We will tackle the problem. We will do it in ways which are consistent with our pre-election commitments, and we will do it in ways which set up this great country for the long term. I call the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister promised the night before the last election, and I quote, no change to pensions. Will the Prime Minister repeat his promise now? And if not, how can the Australian people trust anything this Prime Minister says? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, let me say this uh, to the Leader of the Opposition, Madam Speaker. The most compassionate thing we can do for the pensioners of Australia is to make sure that the pension is sustainable. Make sure that the pension is sustainable for the long term. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, uh, there will be no changes to pensions without an election first. I call the honourable, I call the honourable member for Flynn. Flynn. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. How will investment in infrastructure help to achieve the government's goal to improve productivity and expand the economy? What legacy in road funding did the government inherit? I call the Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for Flynn for his question. He knows and was part of a coalition campaign in which we committed as a government to deliver the roads for the 21st century. We undertook to build the roads and rail lines that would be necessary to build our nation's productivity and secure our, secure our nation's future. Now, the legacy we inherited from the previous government was, of course, pretty disappointing, well short of their rhetoric well short of their rhetoric. Indeed, if you think of the last two Labor budgets, they spent $2.6 billion and $3.5 billion on roads and rail. And of, and of course, when they left, many projects were behind schedule or haven't even, hadn't even started. The reality is their performance was abysmal. And when they had an opportunity to actually do some things to build the infrastructure of the 21st century, uh, the big spend that they went into following the, uh, uh, the, in their response to the global financial crisis, they didn't put the money into, into investments that would have generated real long-term productive benefits. Now, instead, it built double-priced school halls, which have done nothing to improve education uh, outcomes in, a, in our country. It, it disastrously installed roof insulation, and the Royal Commission's hearing all about that at the present time. And of course, it engaged in a multitude of, of wasteful green schemes that did nothing to enhance our economy. It wasted billions. Labor often boasted about what it spent because it didn't have much to boast about when it came to delivery. It was not a government of, of achievement, it was a government of expenditure. And indeed, just 14 per cent of the stimulus package spent in response to the global financial crisis was spent on productivity enhancing infrastructure. Just 14 per cent. And that minor, minor share continued to deteriorate. Well, Madam Speaker, over the next couple of days, the Australian people are going to hear a lot about infrastructure, about plans for the future, 
about building the infrastructure that our country will need for the next century. And tonight the Treasurer will show how this government will deliver on its commitments to the Australian people here, here. to build the infrastructure that we need. That infrastructure will drive economic growth, it will slash travel times in our cities and create thousands of jobs to help build a productive future for our country. I call the honourable member for Greenberg. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Firstly, I seek leave to table the $20 billion of new infrastructure projects that was in the 2013 is budget. Leave is granted. Yeah. Leave is not granted. Oh. You have the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why is a dollar invested from the Commonwealth in roads good, but a dollar invested from the Commonwealth in public transport bad? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I'm delighted to see money being invested in public transport and uh, money being invested in urban rail systems uh, should be invested by the state governments uh, which own and operate the urban rail systems and what we will see what we will see after tonight's budget we will see far more opportunity for the state governments to invest uh, in the public transport systems that they own and operate uh, to recycle assets uh, from less productive to more productive assets uh, according to their choice. So what we're seeing in this budget tonight is a record Commonwealth spend on infrastructure and the opportunity for the states to spend record amounts on infrastructure should they choose to do so. And don't we need it? Don't we need it, Madam Speaker? Uh, because thanks to neglect uh, by state Labor governments uh, and by the recent federal Labor government, there is uh, an $80 billion infrastructure gap in this country. Well, Madam Speaker, we didn't create the problem, but we will take responsibility for fixing it. And the fixing starts tonight. I call the honourable member for Hume. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development, representing the Treasurer. I remind the Deputy Prime Minister that the bill for interest repayments on the government's debt is around $1 billion a month. What impact does this have on the economy and how does it compare with the legacy the previous governments inherited? I call the Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Infrastructure and Regional Development, uh, representing the Treasurer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I must thank the Honourable Member for his question. He, draw he draws attention to an appalling statistic that will overhang tonight's budget and indeed our national economy for a decade. And that is the legacy of Labor's debt. The first billion dollars that this government or future governments will collect in tax every month, every month will have to be spent on paying the interest on Labor's debt. Shame. Interest on Labor's debt. It's a billion dollars that perhaps could have built a, a major new hospital in, in every capital city. It would only take six months of this interest payment and we could finish building the whole of the Pacific Highway to four lanes. Indeed, if you go back to 1974, the whole Snowy Mountain scheme cost only $1 billion to build. Only $1 billion in 1974 numbers. Now, in today's numbers, Australian people have to pay $1 billion every month just to pay the interest on Labor's debt. And if they had their way, it would continue to get worse and worse. If the savings tonight uh, that some may not like, if we didn't have to pay $1 billion in interest every month, then those are savings that may not have to be made. If we wanted to spend more on things of significance, if we didn't have to pay that billion dollars every month on interest, then there would be opportunities for us to do so much more. Labor's legacy for six years in government, six years in government is a legacy of debt. They inherited record surpluses and turned them into record deficits. And they did it in their very first year. Very first year, they took savings in the bank surpluses into deficit. 
Labor delivered $191 billion worth of deficits in just, four, in, just, in just its six years, and there was $123 billion more in deficits in store had they still been in government. Well, our task, our task in government is to start restoring the national economy so we can get rid of some of that debt, so that we can spend money on the things that Australians want rather than paying the debts of this disgraceful, this disgraceful administration that was cast out of office at the last election. Unless we take action tonight, the gross debt will rise to $667 billion. And that's a debt for every Australian of almost $25,000 per person. What a legacy Labor has left behind. Now it's our turn to have to correct once again the legacy of Labor's debt and deficit and to get our country moving forward once again. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister but promised the Australian people before the last election, and I quote, we are about reducing taxes, not increasing taxes. We are about getting rid of taxes, not imposing new taxes. Will the Prime Minister repeat his promise now not to increase taxes, not to impose new taxes, and if he can't, how can the Australian people trust anything that this Prime Minister says? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, yes, sir, I'm certainly happy to repeat we are about getting rid of taxes. We want to start, we want to start by getting rid of the carbon tax and the mining tax. We want to start with getting rid of the carbon tax and the mining tax. And why? This is the leader of the opposition. The leader of the opposition is uh, trying to make uh, uh, keeping commitments his theme. Well, why is the leader of the opposition so keen? He, he, he talks. He talks. He talks about keeping commitments while his senators prevent the government from keeping the most important commitment of all, the commitment to get rid of the carbon tax. Madam Speaker, why won't, why won't this Leader of the Opposition allow this government to keep its commitment to abolish the carbon tax? Why? The Prime Minister will resume his seat. Leader of the Opposition. It goes to the question of relevance. I asked a straight question. Are you going to keep your promise not to increase taxes? I give the call to the Prime Minister. Uh, we, are, we are going to honour our commitments. Uh, we're particularly going to honour our commitment to repeal the carbon tax, and I respectfully suggest uh, to the Leader of the Opposition that he, would, that he would have a lot more credibility on the subject of keeping commitments if his senators weren't standing in the way of the repeal of the carbon tax and a $550 a year benefit to every household in this country. I mean, what a fraud this Leader of the Opposition is. What a fraud this Leader of the Opposition is to talk about keeping commitments when his senators are standing in the way of this government keeping its commitments. Keeping its commitments. Now, the Leader of the Opposition has asked the member for Green will desist. The, the leader of the opposition has asked: uh, Is this government going to cut taxes? Yes, this government is going to cut the tax burden. As a result of decisions that this government has taken, the tax burden will be 5.7 billion dollars less, thanks to this government. I call the honourable member for Kennedy. Household electricity prices over nine years of corporatisation have soared from $860 to $2,100. Petrol prices, following the refusal to mandate ethanol, saw 50 per cent above prices in Brazil and America. Whilst with the world's cheapest land, Australia pays the world's highest housing prices. With farm incomes falling disastrously, food prices rise and rise. Can you explain why these are the real issues are not being addressed in this budget? I call the Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister representing the Treasurer. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for Kennedy for his question. And I acknowledge that many of the issues he's raised in his question are important, and they're important to our nation, and they'll be important in tonight's budget. And if he 
can fit it into his busy schedule to actually be present this evening to hear the budget, he will hear a response to each of these particular issues he's raised. The first question was in relation to household electricity prices. Well, in tonight's budget, you may not be surprised to hear, we intend to deliver the end of the carbon tax. Here, here. The end of the carbon tax means lower electricity prices. Here, here. It will make a difference to all Australians. And I trust that the member for Kennedy will enjoy the members on this side of the House when it comes to a vote or when it goes to a vote in the Senate uh, to make sure that the majority of the people in the House actually deliver those cheaper electricity promises that we'll be, we, we will be committing to in tonight's budget. Yeah. He referred also to the role of ethanol in the nation's fuel mix. We have been supportive of the ethanol industry in the past and the budget tonight will be fair also to the ethanol industry. Uh, we, we are working very closely to ensure that our economy works efficiently, that we deliver better infrastructure, I might add, including also in the member for Kennedy's electorate, and that will help to make our economy work better and will make, uh, uh, give a better opportunity for our farmers also to be able to get their products to market in the cheapest and most effective way. And then he spoke about the, 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 the real challenges that farm incomes face. Well, the Minister for Agriculture will be talking tonight about the commitment, the, the fulfilment of our election commitments to the agricultural sector, which will help build a better future for agriculture. And in, and in relation to so many of these issues uh, about farm income, they'll, they'll also be interested in tonight's budget to hear reports of the successful negotiation by the Minister for Trade of new free trade agreements with some of the best markets in the world the markets that can deliver the best possible returns to Australian farmers. So there will be good news in tonight's budget as well. There are some tough decisions that have to be made, but, but good news which will deliver real benefits to people who live in regional Australia and to help ensure that our economy grows more strongly in the future. Here, here. I call the honourable member for MacArthur. Here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. How is the government working to address poor results for Australian school students and what legacy did the minister inherit when coming to government in September last year? I call the honourable the member for I call the honourable the minister for education. Thank you Madam Speaker and I thank the member for MacArthur for his question and I can tell him that we are addressing the poor results of Australian school students that we inherited from the previous government we did it to begin with, by putting the $1.2 billion back in to the school funding model that the Leader of the Opposition took out in the dying days of the previous government, so that Western Australia, the Northern Territory and Queensland would be treated fairly. So we put $1.2 billion back in to the school funding model, meaning that we're actually putting more money into school education than Labor would have if they had been re-elected. We're also moving to address the key issues that affect the outcomes for students. Parental engagement, teacher quality, a robust curriculum and more autonomy for principals because what they indicate, the research indicates that they are the most important determinants of good outcomes for our school students. The most important being teacher quality and I can assure the House that we are listening to the PISA results that were released last December which show that under Labor, under Labor we recorded our worst ever results in all fields of science and maths and reading, and Australia was ranked lower than it has ever been ranked in school results under the previous government. And what did we inherit? I was asked what we inherited, Madam Speaker. Well, we inherited a litany of wasteful programs. The Computers in Schools program. It was supposed to cost $1 billion. It cost two. $0.4 billion, just pin money to the Labor Party, just a mere accounting error. $1.4 billion blowout in the Computers in Schools program. But it gets even worse than that, Madam Speaker, because under the building of the education revolution, because everything under Labor had to have an historic name and had to be revolutionary and had to be the biggest ever, under the building of the education revolution, $16.4 billion spent on school halls. There was no research which indicated 
that $16.4 billion on school halls would improve the outcomes for our students, and yet the estimate is between six to eight billion dollars of that money was wasted on overpriced school halls. In fact, the University of New England said, and I quote, the, the BER program basically ticks all the boxes of what not to do, from mismanaging massive amounts of taxpayers' money, delivering or not delivering infrastructure that fails to meet even the most basic tests of quality or usefulness. That is the legacy of the previous government. Madam Speaker, we are moving to fix that. We are focusing on things that will improve the outcomes for students in tonight's budget. And best of all, we are putting the money back that Labor ripped out in the dying days of their government. I call the, call the honourable member for Adelaide. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The government promised the Australian people before the election you can vote Liberal or Labor and you'll get the exactly the same amount of funding for your school. Will the Prime Minister repeat his government's promise now? If not, how can the Australian people trust anything that this Prime Minister says? The member for Herbert will desist. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, if it's a broken promise, it's only because we're spending more. It's only because we're spending more. We are putting back the $1.2 billion uh, that members opposite, led by the now leader of the opposition, ripped out of the forward estimates in the pre-election fiscal outlook statement. There we are. So they ripped off $1.2 billion. Uh, they ripped off Queensland, Western Australia and the Northern Territory to the tune of $1.2 they're very touchy, Madam the Speaker. They are. I call the Leader of the Manager of Opposition Order. Business. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The question referred not to overall funding but specifically to individual schools and whether that promise will be repeated. The Prime Minister has the call. The Prime Minister has the call. Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker, uh, we will end up spending more over the relevant forward estimates period than Labor because we put back in the $1.2 billion that Labor ripped out. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker this, this uh, is a government which was elected to fix the debt and deficit disaster that we inherited, and fix it we will, and it comes ill of members opposite uh, to complain about the fire brigade when they are the fire. They are the fire. We will put it out. I call the honourable member for Casey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. And I ask what sustained effect has the government's strong border protection policies produced and what has been the reaction to this result? I call the honourable the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Casey for his question. This government is doing what we said we would do on our borders, and we are getting the results, Madam Speaker, that we said we would get. Results that those opposite and others said could not be achieved, that those opposite had given up on. But those on this side of the House, Madam Speaker, knew in our bones that this could be done and that by applying the right policies, in the right hands, with the right resolve, we would get this job done, Madam Speaker, and we are getting it done sustainably. For the last 20 weeks, 145 days, there has not been a single successful maritime people smuggling venture to Australia. Not one. Not one. Those opposite the last two ministers couldn't manage a week without a successful people smuggling venture. And over the same period of time of those 20 weeks, there were 135 such successful ventures under the previous government, and there was 8,946 illegal arrivals over that period of time. Now, Madam Speaker, we know what the cost of that was in terms of sadly lives lost. We know what the cost was of those who were denied visas and had to wait because they were handing visas hand over to fist to people who arrived illegally by boat. But we also know the cost of the budget was blowouts of an $11.5 billion. 
$11.5 billion because of their border failures. And Madam Speaker, tonight this budget will save $2.5 billion because of our border protection success to date. That's what it will save the taxpayer by getting it right on our borders, Madam Speaker. And that's also what will be achieved in addition through the savings of closing the detention centres that that government, when they were in the government, opened. They went on a building the detention centre revolution, Madam Speaker, when they were in government, and it was fuelled by their border failures. And they opened them week after week, bed after bed, centre after centre. Well, we're closing them, Madam Speaker. And we're closing those centres, whether it's in Babraki or whether it's up in Darwin or whether it's in Curtin, Madam Speaker. The Curtin centre that they opened, they said they'd never expanded and expanded to record levels. Madam Speaker, I can understand why those opposite are embarrassed by their border failures and dare not speak about them. What I can't understand, Madam Speaker, is why they hold under them so tightly. Why do they hold on to the policies that failed under their government and continue to reject the policies that are working under this government? I've got a message for them, Madam Speaker. It comes from Disney and that latest movie on Frozen. They're frozen in their time, Madam Speaker, and it's simply this. Let it go, Bill. Let it go. Let it go. You failed in those policies. It's time to let those policies go. I call the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Elsa did it better. <laughs> she was the one who since I, let you it have go. Call. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister promised the Australian people before the election, and I quote, what you'll get under us are tax cuts without new taxes. Will the Prime Minister repeat his promise now? And if not, how can the Australian people trust this Prime Minister uh, on anything he says? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, um, people will see in the budget tonight that this is a government which has kept its commitments. This is a government which has kept its commitments. That's what people will see in the budget tonight. And I have to say, Madam Speaker, that the most fundamental commitment of all was to get the budget back under control, to end the debt and deficit disaster that members opposite left us. And, Madam Speaker, it comes ill of members opposite to keep talking about commitments when, Madam Speaker, they are trying to stop us keeping the most fundamental commitment of all, the commitment to abolish the carbon tax and save the families of this country. $550 every single year. If you take commitments, I, I, say to the I say to the Leader of the Opposition, if he takes commitments seriously, what about allowing us to honour our commitment to end the carbon tax and to do the right thing by the people of Australia? We'll have some silence. I call the honourable member for Higgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to the West Melbourne GP Superclinic, which was promised almost four years ago. Will the Minister please provide an update to the House on the progress of this clinic? I call the Honourable the Minister for Health. I will be silent on my right. The Minister for Health has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for her question and her interest uh, in health matters and providing uh, important health services to her electorate. Well, there's been an important development in the GP Super Clinic program. I want to update the House and the Australian people on what is a very significant outcome in the GP Super Clinic program. But I want to come to that in just a moment, Madam Speaker. <laughs> this is a program which, along with the creation of 12 great big new bureaucracies in health, that will be hanging around the necks of the Labor Party for a generation to come. This program was a complete outrageous waste of taxpayers' money, Madam Speaker. There was $650 million spent on the GP Superclinic program. They only opened half of those that they promised. They only opened half of those that they promised. Some of them are still vacant paddocks six or seven years later, not seeing a patient, not even having started construction. They set up in competition with taxpayers' borrowed money 
in competition with existing GP practices. That is how bad this policy was. They diverted money away from important health services and they put it into this new health bureaucracy. But let me come back to the major development because during the break, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition was with the Shadow Health Minister and they were at the West Melbourne GP Super Clinic, which, which uh, opened four years after it was promised, so in itself not a bad achievement. Now, the manager of opposition business, the minister will resume his seat. I, I ask you to draw the minister back to the question. The minister has the call. Now, Madam Speaker, so there was the uh, leader of the opposition and there was the shadow health minister. Uh, they were at the opening of uh, this great uh, announcement, the West Melbourne GP Super Clinic. It had cost $15 million for a GP Super Clinic to compete with other doctor practices that were in the immediate region, not adding to extra doctor numbers or patient services to be seen. But for $15 million, what, what did you get? What did you get for $15 million? I mean, surely you got some significant health services. One GP, just one GP for $15 million of borrowed money. This was after the Labor Party had run out of money and they were borrowing money to pump into this program which was going to compete and cannibalise existing GP services. Well, let me make this prediction, Madam Speaker. Tonight, we will reform the health system to make sure that we strengthen Medicare going forward, to make sure that we can put health... Seat. The Minister will resume his seat. I call the uh, member for... Sorry. Isaacs. Isaacs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the minister should be asked to be directly relevant to the question. This has uh, nothing to do with the a, question. We've already had a point of order on relevance. Uh, I'm sorry, calling someone back to the question is a point of relevance. The minister has the call. Is the minister completed? I call the honourable member for long one. Uh, sorry, for Bonner. You're on, mate. Uh, my question is to the Assistant Minister for Education. How does the Coalition's approach to improving quality childcare outcomes improve upon the former government's early years quality fund? What steps has the Minister taken to repair the legacy of the former government? I call the Honourable the uh, Minister for, Assistant Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for Bonner for his question. And I look forward to coming to his electorate in Brisbane to open Mother Duck Childcare Centre in Wynnum next Monday. Uh, Madam Speaker, last week I had the pleasure of announcing the largest ever government investment in professional development for the long daycare educators of this country. Largest ever. $200 million allocated to helping long daycare services with the cost of upskilling to meet new quality framework rules, to train educators, to backfill, to buy resources, to support our centres and our educators who work so hard. Now, where did this money come from, you might ask? This money came from Labor's Early Years Quality Fund. That's right, the Early Years Quality Fund. The fund that wasn't about the early years, wasn't about quality, but was in fact a slush fund used for union recruitment, something that was shut down after our independent inquiry found that that's exactly what it was. So I'm pleased to report, uh, Madam Speaker, that for our centres, particularly rural and regional, particularly when it comes to employing an early childhood teacher, the cost of that is high and we need to train our educators. We need to upskill our educators so that they can do the job they do with the children of the next generation. And this is a fund that will help the entire sector, not just Labor's chosen few. Remember the Early Years Quality Fund, 15 per cent, just one in six of every single educator across the country could ever have benefited. This is a fund that will help every single educator in long daycare. It won't be first in, first served. It won't be signed off in a flurry of secret deals with the union behind closed doors just before it was announced, just before the election. Uh, it will be open and transparent. In fact, fact sheets and details are on the website, something the previous minister could never do, could never say sh what she was doing, could never communicate with the Australian people. And most importantly, it will add to the quality of teaching, the quality of childcare, <laughs> the quality of early learning, and centres will be able to choose how they use the money. They won't be told what to do. 
they won't be told what to do. They will be able to use it. They will be able to use it in the way that they can best provide for their educators, their families and their children. So I'm very proud to be announcing this fund today uh, and uh, applications open from next Monday the 19th and um, I look forward, as the CEO of Mother Duck has said, to greatly improve skills, help with implementation of the Quality Fund, Quality Framework and positive outcomes for children. Hear, hear. I call the Honourable the Deputy, Prime Minister, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. In his budget reply last year, the Prime Minister promised the Australian people no one's personal tax will go up. Will the Prime Minister repeat that promise now? Yeah. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, as uh, members opposite will discover soon enough tonight, this is a budget which keeps faith with the commitments that we have made to the Australian people. And, Madam Speaker, and Madam Speaker, the most fundamental commitment of all, the most fundamental commitment of all is to get the budget back under control. Now, Madam Speaker, let's not for a second. The member for Parramatta. Madam Speaker. The Prime Minister has the call. Let, let us remember. Oh, the Prime Minister will resume his seat, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, it's a very clear question. It could be answered with a yes or no. It could be answered with a repetition of the promise that no I one's take personal you are tax asking will go the question. up. Here, here. There's no point of order. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the situation that this government finds itself in is that we are confronting debt and deficit stretching as far as the eye can see. Now, Madam Speaker, I, I, can, I can understand why members opposite are upset about the fire brigade, because they are the fire. Of course they're upset about the fire brigade, because they are the fire. But, Madam Speaker, we did not create this problem, but the people elected us to fix it. That's what the people did, and fix it we will, and we will fix it in ways which are fair and faithful to the pre-election commitments that we made. I call the honourable member for Bradford. Point of order, Madam, Madam Speaker. Point of order. Yes, the on previous occasions when government members have missed the call and we've had two in a row, you've then evened it up during question time. The same thing happened earlier in question time. We presume, we presume that the same process you followed for government standard. members should be followed for opposition. Double. Uh, what, what happened previously is the Deputy Leader of the Opposition did miss the call in that she was not standing when the, when the member was. Uh, there is a difficulty. You were both standing, I have to be honest, uh, and I will give the call to the uh, member for Ballarat. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister promised the Australian people the night before the election no cuts to health. Now that Australians know that they will be paying a GP tax every time they visit the doctor, how can the Australian people trust anything this Prime Minister has to say? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, the important thing is to ensure that government makes the investments that are necessary to ensure that our health system is sustainable and that cures and treatments are better in the future than they have been the in the past. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker um, I think that uh, there are some tough decisions uh, about health in this budget. There certainly are some tough decisions about health in this budget. But what this budget does include is massive investment in better health for all Australians and for people around the world in the years and the decades to come. Uh, and, and, and if the shadow minister, and if the shadow minister uh, uh, is, looking in, is looking for uh, good sense when it comes to health policy, uh, she ought to talk to the shadow assistant treasurer, uh, who certainly did uh, make good sense uh, on this issue in times past. Indeed, the member for Gorton will withdraw his comment earlier as unparliamentary. I withdraw. Thank you. I call the honourable member for Bratton. <laughs> well, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. 
I refer the Minister to the recent State of the Internet report that shows the Australian broadband is slow and expensive. What is the government doing to turn around the results of the former government's management of the NBN? I call the Honourable Minister for Communications. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for his question and note that in his state of Tasmania, the Labor Party's utter catastrophic mismanagement of the NBN had reached such a point that months before the election, construction had completely ceased. Nothing was happening at all. Indeed, Madam Speaker, $7 billion was spent as at the time of the election and the project was less than 3 per cent complete. The reason why so many Australians have such inadequate broadband is because nothing was done by Labor other than to spend $7 billion and connect a handful of people in six years. Six wasted years which should have seen real action, real progress, people being upgraded to competitive speeds and nothing happened while Labor talked about broadband. This was the most wasteful project of the Labor Party and government. Now, this is what we're doing, Madam Speaker. We're getting this project back on track. Already, twice as many Australians, more than twice as many Australians, are actively connected to the fibre network today than were at the election. The rollout is accelerating. We have got the, the project Perth, back on track assist. in Tasmania. The member for Perth. As far as affordability is concerned, and this is a vital issue, a vital issue, because the, our broadband in Australia is expensive relative to other countries. The honourable member's point is absolutely right. But Labor, if Labor had been allowed to continue the project on their plans. Australians would have had to pay up to 80 per cent more of the already high prices in order to pay for what would have been a $73 billion project, $30 billion more than they told Australians it would cost. Now, we will complete this project sooner and Greenway at considerably less cost, considerably less cost, $32 billion less and sooner. And the mix of technologies we will use are consistent with the approach being taken by major telcos, Deutsche Telekom, British Telekom, AT&T, Swisscom, Belgicom. The NBN today the is being run for the first time by competent telecom professionals, the for a board with experienced people, a chief executive the who has actually Perth built and run telecom networks and it's being managed for the first time in a business-like fashion. We cannot recover all of the years lost by Labor or many of the billions lost by Labor, but we are cleaning up the NBN mess as we are cleaning up the rest of Labor's mess. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister told the Australian people before the election it just isn't right that people should say one thing before an election to win votes and do the opposite after an election. Did the Prime Minister deceive the Australian people in order to win votes at the last election? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. There will be silence on my left. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition has asked his question. There will be silence on my left so we can hear the answer. The Prime Minister. Ma Madam Speaker, uh, members opposite the Labor Party uh, will know everything that we have done. Uh, they will know all of the measures that we have taken to address the debt and deficit disaster that the Labor Party has left to this great nation of ours. They will know it all uh, at about 7.30 this evening. The Australian people will be able to make a judgment of us and the actions that we have taken be silence. and the actions that we have taken to address the debt and deficit disaster that Labor has left us. But Madam Speaker, the Australian people know this that no government can go on 
borrowing $1 billion every single month just to pay the interest on the borrowings. No government co can go on doing that. That is the unsustainable situation, the unsustainable situation that this government left us, this opposition, formerly the government, left us. Now, Madam Speaker, um, I, every day in the election campaign, was open and upfront with the Australian people. I said exactly what we were going to do, and what we are going to do is get the budget back under control. We are going to get the budget back under control. That's what we were elected to do, and we will not let the Australian people down. I call the honourable member for Mon Moncrief. No, McPherson. Beg your pardon. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment. I remind the Minister that the carbon tax was a $7.6 billion hit on the Australian economy in its first year of operation, with no meaningful reduction in emissions. Will the Minister explain why the carbon tax must be repealed immediately? I call the Honourable the Member for the Environment. I do hope he was able to hear the question because I had difficulty. Did he hear the question? I was able to hear, Madam Speaker. And uh, I'd like to, th uh, like to thank the member for McPherson, who has come to this place with a tremendously successful career in small business and yeah, brought yeah. that to her judgment on these matters. Now, I am delighted, I am delighted that the Leader of the Opposition has today taken an interest in mandates, taxes and cost of living, because it's a little bit overdue, because if the Leader of the Opposition is interested in mandates, taxes and cost of living, he can get the trifecta in one hit. And that one hit is to repeal the carbon tax. You can repeal the carbon tax. We have all of this confected indignation today that I am terribly concerned, says the Leader of the Opposition, about cost of lifting. And I am terribly concerned about taxes. And I am terribly concerned about mandates. Except when it comes Isaacs to the carbon desist. tax. Except for the carbon tax. So there is a way forward for the Leader of the Opposition. If he has any semblance of commitment to any of the concepts which he suddenly discovered today, he can chat to his senators. Instead, what is happening at the moment is that he is telling his senators to stand in the way of a $7.6 billion dollar five hundred. The member, the, the minister will resume his seat. The member for Grainler on a point of order. <coughs> the member for Grainler has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the minister was asked about his government's policies, not the opposition's. If he wants to speak about the government's policies and taxes on carbon, he can talk about the petrol tax increase that is coming in tonight. There is no point of order. The uh, minister has the call. Our policy is to abolish the carbon tax. Yours is to keep it. And that is a pretty significant difference. We have from here the confected indignation of Mr Mandate. Now he is telling us that keeping mandates is so important. Well, if it means anything, start with the central point on which this government was elected and allow assist. us to abolish the carbon tax. Because this tax, as the member for McPherson sets out, is a $7.6 billion hit on Australian industries and Australian families. If you worry about families, worry about the $550 which you yourself which the Leader of the Opposition could, could relieve them of each and every year going forward. Right now, There's speak to your senators on my and we'll bring back the carbon tax bills this week if you want to give us the passage to repeal them. Because our policy, our policy is to repeal the carbon tax. Your policy is to break your election commitment to terminate the carbon tax. And your policy is to stand in the way of our mandate to abolish the carbon the tax, so we can save assist. Australian firms $7.6 billion. We can save Australian families $550 a year. We can reduce the cost of living. We can improve Australian competitiveness. And all we need is for the Leader of the Opposition to give the word. 
I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister told the Australian people before the election, I will keep my commitments. We will do exactly what we say we will do. I ask again, did the Prime Minister deceive the Australian people at the last election in order to get their votes? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, the short answer is no, of course we didn't, Madam Speaker. Of course we didn't. Of course we didn't. Madam Speaker, we told the Australian people that we would tackle, we would tackle the debt and deficit disaster, the debt and deficit disaster which the Labor Party created, which the Leader the of the Opposition, uh, the Kingmaker and Queenmaker and manipulator the of the former government Adelaide created. Prime Minister that's, has the call. That's what we said, Madam Speaker. That's what we said, Madam Speaker. We told the Australian the people. The opposition will desist. We told the Australian people that we will tackle the debt and deficit disaster that the Labor Party had left this country. That we would tackle the intergenerational theft that the Labor Party had practised on the people of this country. That's what we said we would tackle. And, Madam Speaker, we are up for it. We are up for it. We weren't elected to make easy decisions. We were elected to make tough decisions. There's too much we weren't elected left. to be populist. We were elected to do what is right and necessary for this country. And, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I will gladly submit the budget that the Treasurer of this country brings down tonight. I will gladly, gladly submit that to the judgment of the people of Australia, because the people of Australia will know, the people of Australia will know that this is a government which is up for the challenges of this day. This is a government which is prepared to confront the big decisions that this government faces. This is a government which is prepared to enable the Australian people to be as great as we can be. And that means fixing up the debt and deficit disaster because, Madam Speaker, if you don't fix the budget, you can't fix the economy. And without a strong economy, we cannot be the strong society that every Australian wants to live in. So, Madam Speaker, I am very, very confident, very, very confident that when the Australian people see the budget tonight, uh, there'll be some things that they like, there'll be other things that they don't like, but they will know that the adults are back in charge and they will know that they have a government that is capable of rising to the challenges of these times. And on that note, Madam Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the Speaker.